This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The bizarre case of Kelly Wilson's disappearance shocked all of East Texas when new indictments were handed down Friday. Prosecutor Scott Leifert says today he's confident about the evidence he has to go to trial with. And he says the evidence is more than circumstantial. The um, evidence in regard to Kelly Wilson came up in the course of the investigation that we were doing uh, on the sexual abuse of the children that had been taken away from the different members of the Kerr family. We think that there may be more victims, but we don't have any uh, concrete evidence. We don't have any particular missing people that we're looking for. Uh, That's part of the investigation that we've got to go into. Over a two-day period in late January 1994, a grand jury in Gilmer, Texas, indicted eight people for the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Kelly Day Wilson, a local teenager who'd been missing for more than two years. Among the indicted were five members of a local family, the Kerrs. Needless to say, the news shocked all of us in East Texas. Most bizarre of all were details found not in the indictments themselves, but in the affidavit for a search warrant executed on the Kerr family property in the woods outside of Gilmer. In the affidavit, investigators claimed that members of the Kerr family were leaders of a cult that forced their own children to participate and satanic rituals, including the sacrifice of babies. If the children ever told anyone the same thing or worse would happen to them. In cahoots with the Kerrs, allegedly, was none other than James York Brown, the Gilmer cop who'd been leading the search for Kelly since day one. Life charges that as the chief investigator in the Kelly Wilson case, Sergeant Brown had a unique position to suppress and destroy evidence. Well, just what is the connection between Kelly Wilson's disappearance, Sergeant James Brown, and the Kerr family? Until the arrest of Sergeant James Brown, no one could have believed what the indictments were. Now, Sergeant Brown stood accused of three of the most heinous crimes imaginable. If convicted, he could face the death penalty. Folks in Gilmer didn't know what to believe. The town was divided between people who thought that Sergeant Brown was as innocent as Snow White and those who thought he was as guilty as Charles Manson. That's Philip Williams, the journalist from Gilmer. You heard from him earlier in the series. Less than a month after the felony indictments dropped against James Brown and the others, Texas Assistant Attorney General Shane Phelps was on a government plane flying straight to Gilmer. The first stop for Shane and his team from the AG's office the Kerr family compound on Cherokee Trace, the narrow road that meanders through the forest outside of town. When I went up there, went out and visited the, um, the Kerr's property, um, I didn't know much about life or didn't know these other guys, Brooks, and, uh, Brooks Flag and Steve Bags, or these CPS workers. To the best of my ability, I kept an open mind. I mean, because stuff happens. I mean, there is some crazy stuff that goes on out there. As you look at the property, it's a long three-acre uh, piece of property with a house on the left and a little shed on the right, closer to the road. Uh, and then as you go back, there's a little trail that goes back and there's a wooded area and there's a trail that goes around and it just comes back. So it creates a circle, which, which they believed was somehow uh, satanic in nature. Was there a clearing in the middle of the circle, or was it all just forested? No, it was mostly forested, as I recall. I mean, there was a, I remember there was a tree cut down that they said it had been desanctified. Um, that was the tree that they would string people up on and, and eviscerate them and pass their organs around and sexually assault them. I mean, it was a wild story. And, according to the Lyford team, Sergeant Brown was right there in the middle of the action. They believed he helped the Kerrs kidnap and sacrifice Kelly Wilson. Their theory of the case was that uh, somehow the way it ultimately developed was that James Brown knew her, may have been having an affair with her, um, that James Brown was seen by witnesses out at the Kerrs having coffee with Geneva all the time. Geneva Kerr was the family grandma. So their theory was that, that in a van with Wendell Kerr, and I guess James Brown, and other people involved kidnapped her uh, in this van, brought her back to Cherokee Trace, the property that the Kerrs owned 
um, and over the next 14 days would um, keep her shackled in this little shed. And on a daily basis, they would take these, or take Kelly out of the shed and take her down to this circle and, and string her up on the tree. And, uh, and they, they would, one after the other, violate her in every way possible. Um, ultimately, they, they, you know, well, they would take her out there, everybody would rape her, they'd do these horrible things to her, bring her back, shackle her up, and, you know, rinse and repeat for 14 days. Now, keep in mind that they had also developed the theory that there were numerous other victims, uh, hitchhiking teenage girls, just kept disappearing, and they would do all the same things to them, um, and babies. There was all this stuff in these interviews about trying to, to question these, these people who were uh, related to Geneva, um, talking about how they were, they were basically raised to breed babies so that they could do this. She was supposed to be the kind of the head witch slash Satanist, I guess. Um, everybody was doing things for her, you know, sacrificing bodies and giving her gifts. And, I mean, it was an outlandish story. It was a really, really bad, you know, slasher flick. Uh, that, that, that it, it was just outlandish. Anybody listening to their story would have said, that's just crazy. And of course, if you said that, uh, you became part of the problem. But I remember walking out there and went out to the back and saw the, the, the circle where all of this stuff is supposed to have gone on. And I was asking questions. I was asking questions of Brooks Flagg. Brooks Flagg, you might remember, was a police chaplain from Louisiana. According to his 2011 obituary, Flagg served in U.S. military intelligence as a cryptograph operator at the height of the Cold War, gathering intelligence on visits to communist East Germany. Later, he became a businessman and founded a Christian retreat called the Shepherd's Rest. Somehow, along the way, Flagg came to view himself as an expert on satanic cults and ritual abuse, which I guess is how he crossed paths with Steve Baggs, a former Texas Department of Public Safety narcotics officer. Steve Baggs, also a self-styled expert on Satanists, hasn't responded to any of my requests for an interview. Neither has Scott Lyford, for that matter. Anyway, back to the Kerr place. Apparently, they had got DPS to do a flyover with infrared technology, and they, they saw some hot spots, and then they brought cadaver dogs out, and they hit on two or three spots. And I remember one was at the base of a tree, and I was standing there with Brick's flag, and, he, and I said, well, did, did you dig it up? Well, they didn't go down very far, but, but they said yes, and they found nothing. In fact, in any of the spots that were identified, they found nothing. Um, I mean, nothing. And... I'm thinking what you've described is, you know, ritual sacrifices, people being eviscerated, organs being passed around. There should be blood and semen and, and saliva and, you know, bits of flesh everywhere based on what you guys are relaying here. And there's none of that. I'd ask a number of questions about were you able to recover anything that could be tested to corroborate this story. And, and I will never forget this. I, I asked Brooks Flagg about that. Does it bother you that there's virtually no trace evidence of any of this occurring? And he was, he was very smug, very, you know, confident. The fact, he said, that these are, these are master Satanists and the fact that, they, that there is no evidence proves that they're master Satanists, proves that it happened. I was frankly pretty shocked by it. You just told me that you have no evidence and that proves that it happened. And at that point, I knew that this was all bullshit. There was nothing to it. We were just kind of trying to process all of this information. And we quickly realized after meeting with some of these um, officials and after actually meeting these folks and seeing them, some of the things they were saying were happening out there and seeing that there really was no evidence of it, we thought, this is, this is scary and dangerous. They had already indicted all of these people, six or seven, I mean, Kerr and their extended family. And the most shocking thing to me was that one of the people they indicted 
was James Brown, who was the sergeant at the Gilmer Police Department, who had been investigating Kelly Wilson's disappearance for two years at this time. And I was just stunned. I mean, come on, that's just not, it just makes no sense. Why not? There was nothing that pointed to James Brown. I mean, he was the police officer involved. And it was just another victim of this. In the last episode, we got into the claims against Sergeant Brown. When Shane Phelps heard the same allegations, well, he was having none of it. Shane had flown to Gilmer to assist the special prosecutor, Scott Lyford. Now he had a new mission. Stop the Lyford team to end what he considered a witch hunt and clear Sergeant Brown's name. The truth needed to come out. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Wes Ferguson. This is Devil Town. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. Amazon Music presents Cold, the search for Cherie. Cherie Warren left her job in Salt Lake City on a chilly October night in 1985. She told a co-worker she was going to meet her estranged husband, Charles Warren, at a car dealership, but she never made it. Cherie vanished. And when her car mysteriously surfaced weeks later, hundreds of miles away in Las Vegas, no one could say how it got there. Police turned suspicious eyes towards the husband. And although there was distrust towards Charles Warren, he wasn't the only suspect when Cherie went missing. She also had a boyfriend, a former cop named Carrie Hartman. and He lived a sinister double life. Season three of Cold follows two suspects, men who both raise suspicion for investigators. This season, host Dave Cauley digs into the lives of these two men, the details of the case, and examines the intersections between domestic abuse and sexual violence. Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Cold, in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. This is Chapter 4, Witch Hunt. I remember vividly the first time I met James. I remember walking into the jail and the first words out of his mouth, the man he was about to cry, he said, I didn't do this. David Moore is a longtime attorney in Longview, an East Texas city about 20 miles south of Gilmer. He, he looked stunned. He looked, he looked stunned. He looked scared. Um, I don't think he was angry at that point. I think that that was sort of overridden by the by the fear that he had yeah. uh, that that somebody could do this to him. You know, I think I think later through time that has obviously morphed into more anger than anything else. But at that in that moment, I saw fear. Sergeant Brown and his wife Penny had been married less than two months when he was arrested. She tried to visit him in jail, but that was not allowed. Penny's first glimpse of her new husband came a little later during a hearing at the Justice Center. They had a hearing with all the defendants. I was not able to talk to him, but I did see him at because I was in the uh, in the back there with the other people. His face was just sunken in. He looked terrible. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, he just, he looked like a different person. Unlike members of the Kerr family who'd been sitting in jail for months, Sergeant Brown spent six days in lockup before he was released on bond. The first time I saw him after the hearing was when he was released and I went and picked him up. He said, 
if you want to leave me, I understand. And uh, I just remember telling him, no, I'm going to stand by your side and fight with you because you didn't do anything wrong. You're an innocent man. I felt like I was uh, in a different world. It was shocking, you know. I was really elated that he had been released. But looking at him, I could tell he was uh, uh, a nervous wreck, you know, shaky and sad, concerned. But we drove to his parents' house. The drive would have taken about 45 minutes. When they got there, Sergeant Brown's son, Josh, from a previous marriage, was waiting. I was at my grandparents' house the day he got released. And uh, my grandmother kept saying, oh, I got a surprise for you, I got a surprise for you, I got a surprise for you. And I said, Dad's coming. I mean, I just felt it. I said, Dad's coming. He pulled in the driveway just like two, three minutes later. Pulled in the driveway and, yeah, man, I just, that's my, <laughs> that's my dad. His blue Chevrolet three-quarter ton truck came driving in front of my grandparents' house. They had two big windows in front of their house. And uh, I saw it coming. I hurt. I just knew Dad was coming. And uh, he showed up. And, you know, Dad was there. I absolutely ran out the door. Big hug. You know, I mean, it really hadn't been long, but, uh, you know, I was worried. You know, kids worry. People say they don't, but, you know, they do. Um, You know, I mean, the reunion was, it came in, and, you know, just everybody just, my granddad was still alive, and everybody just hugged, and and then it was it was back to business as usual. We went, we went fishing. Uh, still, still remember that. You know, my my grandparents had uh, had a couple of ponds, and you know we kind of went and gave them hell. You know, although Josh was visiting his grandparents when his dad was released from jail, his mom had actually moved Josh and his little brother to another area of the state. But even there, they couldn't escape news of his dad's legal jeopardy. You know, he shielded us from. I say shielded us. Tried to shield us from what was going on. I, I mean. You know, and, and we would hear stuff on the radio. I can remember sitting in the car when uh, when I lived in West Texas. Uh, my mom had forgotten something in the house and got out of the car and went back in. She was taking us to school and hearing an article uh, about dad. Um, and she got back in the car and I said, Mom, they're talking about dad. It was a lot for a 10-year-old kid to process. You know, trying to figure out you know, why he was arrested. And then thinking that there's no way this side of hell that what he was arrested for is what he did. Because he is such a good father. Sergeant Brown's wife thought he was innocent. His son thought he was innocent. But his lawyer, David Moore, thought he could prove it. Sergeant Brown had kept a meticulous journal of his whereabouts during the early weeks of the search for Kelly. If David could find out what specific day Kelly was supposed to have been sacrificed in the woods behind the Kerr house, there was a good chance Sergeant Brown's journal would offer up an alibi. There was just one problem with that plan. Scott Lyford couldn't even say when the murder happened. So I'm trying to get a timeline uh, from Lyford about you know, when supposedly she was killed because they allegedly kidnapped her, kept her for X number of days, raped her over that period of time, uh, multiple times, did all these other satanic ritual deals and then killed her in a ritualistic uh, manner. And uh, I was wanting to know when, you know, because I felt pretty confident that we, because James was supposedly there raped her on an occasion and then also was there when she was killed. And I, I was feeling fairly confident that if I could get that, that date that, you know, we already had probably 80% of his whereabouts covered. And um, I asked Lyford, I said, well, when, when was the killing? Well, I don't know. 
I said, what do you mean you don't know? I mean, you've even indicted this, this guy for uh, her murder and you, you can't tell me even when it was? I don't know, we're working on that. We'll get that to you. Not long after his troubling conversation with Lyford, David got another phone call. This one from Al McAllister, the Gilmer police chief. Al McAllister was a strong supporter of Brown. I can't go into any details right now other than to say that I'm happy he's out of jail. And I look forward to the time when our story can be completely told. And uh, I think it's time for the man to show us what, he, what evidence he has. You mean the, dis- the special prosecutor? I mean the special prosecutor. There have been many people who will tell you the most fantastic stories about Sergeant Brown that you've ever heard. And especially they've risen to the, to the surface and come out of various places to make all manner of allegations against Sergeant Brown. So it certainly doesn't surprise me that somebody might say that. Remember, Sergeant Brown had not even been a suspect until he stuck his nose in the Lyford investigation. At that time, Lyford had threatened to ruin him if he didn't back down. And next thing you know, Sergeant Brown is in jail. Now the Lyford team wanted Brown's investigative reports, and Chief Al McAllister didn't want to hand them over. They were threatening Al that if he didn't turn over James's uh, investigative file, to them that they were going to haul Al in front of the grand jury and charge him with with something. And I was worried, Al was worried, James was worried, that if they were to get his file of all the things he was meticulous about, what what he did when and where he was, that if they had that, then they would be able to tailor their story, their version, and work around whatever kind of alibis that James would have had. David filed a motion to block the Lifer team from getting access to Brown's file until they could actually figure out when the murder happened. To Judge Garrison's credit, he, he shut them down on that and told them not to turn that over. And I think that was probably the first time they got any pushback from anybody. And it was obvious something was rotten. You know, something didn't smell right. As for Shane Phelps, he'd flown back to the Attorney General's office in Austin and he had a bunch of cassette tapes. Recordings of the Lifer team's interrogations with Wanda Kerr, Connie Martin, the common-law wife of Danny Kerr, and Raymond Smith, the little boy who'd connected the Kerr abuse to Kelly Wilson's disappearance. Shane was sitting at his desk when he hit play. And I got angrier and angrier. I mean, I was, I think I started listening to it one or two o'clock in the afternoon. I was there until almost midnight listening to this. And I got to the point where I was throwing things around in my office. I was so angry. Really? Oh, yes. What'd you throw? Oh, God, what was it? Something on my desk. It's a paperweight. You threw a paperweight? I did. I was pissed off. I mean, it, it is so far afield of anything that any responsible law enforcement officer or prosecutor would ever, ever do. It wasn't marginal. It wasn't a difference of opinion about how these things should be done. It was, in my mind, criminal. And there was no other evidence. I mean, when we, I, I listened to these audio interviews, and their investigative methods were horrendous. They were practically non-existent. You know, they're supposed to have two investigators with investigative experience. No law enforcement officer worth a damn with any dedication to doing the job properly would ever have participated in these, in these interviews. I've also been listening to the tapes. It's hard. The material is just really graphic and gross, and it goes on for hours on end. And yet, sometimes the interrogators actually seem to be enjoying themselves. All right, so James is over there. He ought to be through taking his clothes off now. So we got James without any clothes, we got the stick in Kelly. What's the next thing that happens? Somebody else undress or does James get on at this point or what's the deal? I don't know why my mind works the way it does. That's beginning to worry me. (laughs) If you couldn't hear that, either Bags or Flag, I think Flag, said, I don't know why my mind works the way it does. That's beginning to worry me. Okay. He's completely nude, right? Naked. Mm-hmm. Skinny ass son of a bitch. Okay. Anyway, that on tape. I still laughing the way your mind works. <laughs> 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 
skinny ass son of a bitch. Is that on tape? Connie is still laughing at the way your mind works. The interrogators definitely seem to have overactive imaginations. I'll never forget listening to Raymond's, the audio tape of Raymond's interview, when he's talking about all this bizarre stuff. And it's all, it was clearly being suggested. And what this was not coming out of the mind of these children, it was coming out of this, the Lifer team. And what they knew had to have happened if Satanists were involved. So we know this is the practice. If you're not giving us, you know, validating our, our theory, then you're not being truthful. Um, so I was listening to the Raymond audio tape, and there was nothing about James Brown. And I'm about to turn it off. I was in my office in Austin. I was about to turn it off, um, reaching for the you know, off switch when, because they had ended the interview, when they came back on and said, Raymond, do you have something else to tell us? And he said, yes, Sergeant Brown was there. And then they just turned it off. Is it thank you, Raymond? Something like yeah. Uh, they so didn't you, follow through. They didn't say, well, how do you know he was there? Were you there when he was there? How many times was he there? How was he dressed? What did he do? Had you ever seen him before? No questions like that. They, and we have no idea how much time elapsed between when they we have not, stopped recording and when no. they started up again. No. And I, I guarantee you that there was stuff going on at that point. What uh, between them. There, was, between them. there would be no reason to have any conversation with this kid um, that wasn't recorded. And yeah, so that... that lapse in time, however long it was, was, um, was very suspicious. The attorney general's office did not give me the recordings of Raymond. I assume to protect his privacy. As I mentioned before, Raymond has given us permission to use his name. And the same thing with Connie. I mean, it was no, 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 until it was yes. Keep me in mind that a couple of important things about Connie and Wanda, um, both of them borderline intellectual functioning. Uh, low IQ, um, and they were being threatened with life sentences. And they'd been indicted, you know, ultimately indicted for death penalty cases. So uh, if you listen to these, they repeatedly say, no, I don't know what you're talking about. It didn't happen. And when that's, ne- we're going to keep going until you tell us what we want to hear is basically their, their investigative strategy. You will eventually tell us what we want to hear, which is what happened. Why don't we go back and let's go through this whole thing and don't leave anything out this time. You want to try that? Tell you, once you get it out, it's over with. This is the reason we have to keep going again and again and again is because you keep leaving so much stuff out in the middle, you know? And you've already told Bunch, you've already told Debbie, we already know most of it. But you need to tell us about it. You need to fill in all those gaps in your story. Now, y'all picked her up and you brought her home. Is that right or wrong? Look at me. Are you telling the truth on that? Yes. Listening to the tapes, I can see what Shane means. But what about all the physical evidence we've heard about? The human bone the Lifer team found in that same field where Connie said they'd buried women and children. What about the shed? where Bags and Flag found the torture devices. These two were among the most salacious details of the case. But was it actually true? Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well... There is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity, influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. 
influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast, wherever you listen. things they make you do is kill people and drink the blood and eat the body parts and most of the time they keep all their little bodies in one location because they like to go back and get the bones and the skulls and the teeth and do things with those that it's real likely that those bodies are back there somewhere did you ever see anyone anyone pick up one of those bodies or body parts and walk off from that circle back into the woods. In an interview with Connie Martin, they had gotten her to say that they um, would bury these hitchhiking teenage girls that they murdered and, and raped and ate their organs and I mean just crazy stuff like that, but that they would save the bones and they would bury them in black plastic, I think it was. Is it a bag or is it just black plastic? It was a black bag. Okay. Put a black bag down in there. Then what does he do? Does he put anything else in the hole? The bones. Okay. The bones are in the bag or he puts the bag in and puts the bones on top of it? No, the bones are in the bag. They're in the bag. He puts the black bag with the bones in it into the hole. And so they identified where they said they buried it, and they went out there with a bag. Where did they? Where did they say they had buried it? It was just in some field somewhere there in Upshur County, um, part of a. I kind of got the impression it was a farm, because there was a house nearby, but it was just an open field. And so I, when we went up there and visited with them, we actually went out to that field, and they were pointing out that they had found a bone. Um, and some bits of black plastic. They said it was wrapped in plastic, I don't think it was, but they got to the point where they looked at it and they, and they discovered it because they dug up a, a good part of the field, not maybe a quarter of it. But they showed me where they found the bone and then that was right at the edge of where they had been digging. And I said, well, why did you stop? I mean, if you have this story that you now believe is corroborated that more than one person has been murdered and their bones are buried in this field and you find a bone that you think corroborates your story, why the hell did you stop digging? This whole field should be dug up. They didn't really have a satisfactory answer. Remember, this is the same bone I mentioned in the last episode, the one that appeared to belong to a human female of Kelly's age. It seemed like one of the most crucial pieces of physical evidence the Lifer team had discovered in months of investigating. The bone that they said that they sent off to a forensic anthropologist that they found in this field and said that it was a female juvenile tibia. Pretty specific for, for that. So they figured that that corroborated. I mean, every step of the way, they saw things or perceived things that would support their belief, and so they'd keep going. And they would totally ignore, I mean, just enormous evidence that none of this happened, which was very frustrating uh, to hear. Um, I'll give you an example of the bone that they found when I kind of took over the case. I had that bone transferred to a laboratory, and it came back as a pig bone. For real, a pig bone. I was like 14 at the time, and I still remember being stunned by that revelation. Yeah, it was, it, it wasn't even close. I don't know what forensic anthropologists they got to look at it, but come on. And I'm, not, I'm pretty sure you can't just look at it and say that it's a 14-year-old juvenile, you know, tibia from a female. I just don't, maybe there is that technology, but I don't think so. Certainly not at that time. Um, uh, another example is that they talked to these kids and they got the wildest stories out of these kids. Um, 
that there was a dungeon where they were taken and, and the, all these children were repeatedly raped. Um, I mean, just by one adult after another. And uh, the, the kids, at least some of them had said it was in this place they called the dungeon. There was a, a storm shelter or something in the back. And they said, well, this, this looks like the dungeon. So they start looking around and they see some stains on the walls. Well, they do one of these, uh, I guess they get somebody in to do one of these presumptive tests. They are not confirmatory. Uh, and with tests like that, oftentimes there are false positives. Well, these tested uh, according to them. Now, I never saw the results, but tested uh, presumptively for human blood. Um, they sent it off to the laboratory and it came back as not human blood. But when they heard presumptively for human blood, these kids are telling the truth. All that stuff happened there. Of course, there was nothing ever recovered from there that you would expect to be recovered from a dungeon where there had been serial raping of, of you know, children. Is that the one that was supposed to be like a penis-shaped elevator or something like that? Yes. Uh, you know, a kid tells me about a penis-shaped elevator, I'm probably going to have some misgivings about whether this child is telling me the truth. It didn't stop them at all. They didn't slow down at all. Anything that they, um, that they encountered that in their brains corroborated their story, they just kept going. Um, if, if they talked to somebody who said, I don't know what you're talking about, then instead of, well, maybe there's a problem here, it was, this person is too afraid to talk to us. Um, because as, as they came to believe, everybody was involved. Remember that shed, the one behind the Kerr house where Kelly was supposed to be kept for two weeks? Investigators descended on the Kerr family home today to catalog every item. The Kerr home is where they believe Gilmore High School senior Kelly Wilson was allegedly raped, held against her will for nine days, and then stabbed to death. Investigators concentrated on several sheds behind the house. Region 56 News has learned prosecutors suspect Wilson was killed in one of those sheds. Blood was allegedly found on the walls. A they found a search warrant did a couple of searches of the shed. Um, and you would expect to find her hair, maybe even bits of flesh, blood certainly, because she had been, you know, tortured, semen, saliva, you know, trace evidence. I mean, you, I, 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 if I brought in a forensic CSI person to come in here, they could find evidence that Wes Ferguson was in this office just from this interview. And they found nothing. With one exception. They did find something that they just process in their minds as being corroborative. They found a, a bag. I've, I've got one of these in my pickup truck. I've got a, like, a weekend pickup truck. And I've got a bunch of bungee cords in it because sometimes I'll put stuff in the back to take to the dump and I need to, you know. So they found this bag that had things like bungee cords and things like that in it. So like in their, straps. Uh, yeah, in their mind, that was those were the implements of torture. Shackles in there where you could... Uh... You know, like handcuff somebody to the wall, and there were cat and nine tail whips in there, and all kinds of satanic stuff. Uh, and that's all they perceived it as, and it supported their theory. Um, they found some Halloween masks in somebody's house, um, and that, you know, like one was a mask of a you know a devil that you can buy at any of these Halloween stores, and that played into their their scenario. By this point, the way Shane tells it, the members of the Lifer team were so wrapped up in a conspiracy of their own making, they were afraid of their own shadows. And yet they pressed on, building their case against James Brown and the Kurs. The two CPS workers, Ann Gore and Debbie Minshew, had been among the first people to uncover evidence of incest and multi-generational abuse in the Kerr family. And while it doesn't sound like Gore and Minshew had a lick of law enforcement credentials or training, Scott Lyford had welcomed them onto his team. They even participated in the interrogations of Connie Martin. Why is it upsetting you? Why are you shaking? Because I'm scared. Why? Why? Where are the tears coming from? What else have you not told? I want the truth. What else? What else? Look at me, Connie. What else? 
Did they burn her up? What else? Who burned her? Penny and Wendell, Jane and Geneva. Well, you weren't there. You were in the house, weren't you? I want the truth, Connie. They burned her up. And what did they make you do? As the scope of their investigation widened, everyone became a suspect. The team could trust no one. If you remember, they were operating out of a secret headquarters in the forests outside of town. They had basically created a bunker out in the middle of the woods, out somewhere, that they didn't want anybody to know about because by this time, in their brains, everybody was involved. Everybody was suspect. They couldn't trust anybody. The sheriff, the chief of police, anybody who had any skepticism about what they were saying happened. Uh, it's like the whole town was a conspiracy den, devil worshipers. It, it was weird. Yes, that's, that's a, truly what they believed. But it became painfully obvious after coming back to Austin after that first visit that we now had uh, uh, an, an inexperienced team that was so far into this and so far over their head that really bad things were going to happen if something didn't stop it. And so the decision was made uh, to basically fire Scott Leifer, take over the case. Um, so I flew up to Gilmer and met with Scott in the Golden Corral up there. It was a very bizarre experience, very Twilight Zone-ish. I don't know why I had that, that sense, but I sat down with Scott and I told him, Scott, we're, we're taking over the case. Kind of an interesting thing about that is that I really had no authority to do that. Um, there is a great deal of ignorance out there about what the Attorney General's office can and cannot do in criminal law. And the fact is that the Attorney General's office, again, has very limited jurisdiction. We only ever came, at least when I was doing it, only ever came into a jurisdiction with the permission of the local prosecutor. We only ever prosecuted as either deputized assistants or pro tem attorneys when the district attorney or county attorney had recused themselves. Um, but with respect to the ability to go in and fire somebody, keep in mind that Scott Leifert was appointed by the district judge, so he was the district attorney for that case. And fortunately, he was ignorant enough about the process that he didn't know I couldn't do it. Scott Leifert could have said, I don't care what you think, I am the appointed prosecutor pro tem. And, and one of the shortcomings of our system is that there is no oversight for prosecutors. So I really didn't have any authority to do it, but I knew that most people don't know that. So I just told him he was fired. I mean, I didn't put it in exactly that way. I just, I, I said, we're taking over the case. I, I left it open that, look, if you want to remain involved, we're happy to, to have your help. Um, and, and I think at that point, it was, it was, there was some sincerity in that offer because I didn't have a full understanding at this point of just how wrong this whole thing had gone. I remember, you know, my first meeting with Shane. This is James Brown's attorney, David Moore, again. And uh, I remember him telling me that there's some things that we're aware of that you don't even know. And he said, I can promise you, your client's going to get a fair shake on this deal. He said, if you'll, if you'll, you know, he didn't say exactly, exactly like this, but essentially if I would be cooperative with them, uh, and I was, you know, feeling anything but cooperative with the prosecution at that point in time because I, I knew that that there were shady things that were happening. And ultimately, he did did what he said he was going to do, and that was look at it, look at it objectively. Shane also provided Sergeant Brown's attorney with the recordings of the interrogations. I, I remember when I got the tapes, I got them from you know when the AG got involved. And uh, Shane Phelps turned them over to me, and I just remember listening to them and just being so angry at what they were doing. So angry. I could not believe, when I actually got the recordings, how unprofessional, um, how insidious the investigation really was, the the the... It's just, it was crazy. It was crazy.
You need to listen to them because there's times when they're trying to get from Connie the and it's and it's just almost comical in hindsight but they're trying to to get her to say that there's a police officer out there and um it's very suspicious the way that happens because they'll have the tape recorder running and and then she'll get lost and can't provide them detail and there's times where where i believe it's lyford says well we'll come back to that there's times when i think lyford testified that they wanted to make sure everything was recorded so nobody could accuse them of of um you know planting things in the witnesses heads or suggesting answers to them and then you know i'll be i'll be darned if they don't say well let's go off of uh you know sort of go off camera so to speak yeah. and then you come back and then connie spits out james brown's name i mean she couldn't before they took the break tell me everybody that was at the house when you got home Jane and geneva and family not everybody and raymond and daniel and Danny. still not everybody and james okay that's james brown yes okay like they would if connie couldn't get her story right for that evening and they went back back and forth with her multiple times uh, Lyford would make comments like, come on, Connie, you know the answer. Uh, tonight's cigarette h hangs in the balance. We're not dumb, girl. We're not dumb. And you make it hard on us and hard on yourself. And you know what else you do? You could have had a cigarette 15 yeah. minutes ago if you had just said, oh, yeah, they use a metal detector. That's how they I happened. didn't think about that at the time. Oh. Well, you cost yourself 15 minutes worth of cigarettes. Connie, look at me. You know, they'd take her out and let her smoke cigarettes and, you know, uh, get her food and stuff like that. Um, and, and Connie's IQ, you know, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was sub-average sub IQ. Um, Their local reporter, Philip Williams, described it as having the IQ of a firm. Well, she had a little more going on than a fern, but not a whole lot. And, uh, you know, she was subsequently, I think, tested. And I, I don't remember what the exact score was, but it was, you know, it was well below 100. And so, I, you know, I, I feel like Connie and Wanda were taken advantage of by Lyford and his bunch. Um, there's one point on the tapes where Lyford, they send Connie back to her cell and um, Lyford makes a comment. Uh, Connie's having a hard time figuring out this carrot and stick thing. I, I'm not kidding you. I mean, you, you're rolling your eyes at me and, and looking in disbelief, but you're going to hear those types of things. And when I was hearing those things, I remember one point slamming my coffee cup and getting coffee everywhere just because I was so pissed off. That they, that they could do something like that to somebody. And it's a damn good thing for the Kurds, honestly, that, that James Brown got indicted. Yeah. I seriously. Can you expound on that? Because, because the Kurds were poor people. The Kurds, some of them, may have may or may not have been guilty of the sexual allegations that are against him. They were not very sympathetic defendants. James, on the other hand, uh, I, think it, I think that them indicting him drew attention to the case, which ultimately served the Kurs well. If not for the indictment of James Brown, the case might have carried on with no scrutiny from the outside world, no national media, or intervention by the Attorney General's office. The Kerrs would have been screwed. The woods behind the Kerrs' house, and I, I went out there and looked at it. I mean, there's neighbors all around it, you know, and you would think there was people back there in robes and carrying torches, and neighbors would see stuff like that because it's, it's they're all right there close by. Um, the kids talk about a penis-shaped elevator. 
taking a penis shaped elevator down into dungeons and that they didn't just kill Kelly, that they were sacrificing other babies and shit. And it was just just crazy shit. I don't know how else to say, just crazy shit. And they were a whole hog into into it. And um, you know, unfortunately there wasn't anybody to there to tap the brakes. You know, the first time that happened, you know, I think James tried to do that. I think James tried to do that. I think he paid price for it. Shane Phelps knew what he had to do. It wasn't until getting their files and going through everything with my team at the AG's office, investigators and prosecutors, um, that we realized, I mean, there was no evidence to support these indictments. I mean, I, I can't emphasize it enough. These were indictments that could lead to the death penalty, which is scary. So we had this summit at the attorney general's office where we invited them all up. We had their files, at least most of them. And uh, I, I remember I was at the front of the table talking about it, went through some of the evidence and said, look, we have to dismiss these cases. Would James Brown and the Kerrs walk free? And what about Raymond, the little boy who told CPS workers that Kelly Wilson had been murdered by the Kerr family? From seven years old, my head's been full of devil worshiping, killers, cannibalism, sexual misconduct. Raymond tells all in the next chapter of Devil Town. Devil Town is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and created by me, Wes Ferguson. Executive producer is Jason Hoke. Audio engineering and editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. Original score is by Robert Ellis. Recording by Austin Sisler at Eastside Studios. If you like the show, leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.